Hello, I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers 50. Welcome to the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame for 2022, in which we induct seven new people into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. I'm delighted today, I'm going to be joined by some of the new inductees in, into the Hall of Fame to have an hour of conversation. Thank you for everyone to, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you also to Hire, who are our partners for the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. So without further ado, let's think about the, the Hall of Fame uh, and then look at the new people we're going to in induct into it. The people we induct into the Hall of Fame are people who have had a long-term practical impact on the way we think about management and the way management and leadership is practiced throughout the world. These are people who have had a direct line of influence on management practice. They are the shoulders on whom today's managers now stand, however precariously that stands. So that is the role of the, the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. The people we're going to induct into the Hall of Fame in 22 uh, begin with someone who was tr truly inspirational, uh, deeply charismatic uh, person who I was lucky enough to, to meet and, and talk to, and that is Samantha Ghoshal. Samantha, whose life was cut tragically short, he lived from 1948 to 2004, Samantra was a, an Indian scholar, educator, and author. Uh, he spent the later part of his professional career in Europe. He was a professor of strategic and international management at London Business School from 1994, and before that, a professor at INSEAD. In India, he was the founding dean of the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. He worked for the Indian Oil Corporation before going to the States to study MIT and Harvard Harv Business School. Samantha was a co-author with Chris Bartlett of Managing Across Borders. He also wrote The Individualized Corporation with, with Chris Bartlett, Managing Radical Change, The Differential Network. All of his books were and remain required reading. So Samantha Ghoshal. The next people we would like to induct into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame are Rob Goffey and Gareth Jones. Gareth very sadly died last year. Uh, Rob and Gareth are best known for their work on leadership. They are the authors of The Character of a Corporation, which came out in 1998. I think it's kind of un an underestimated book, actually, I think. Uh, most famously, they're the authors of Why Should Anyone Be Led by You, which was a Harvard Business Review article before it became a best-selling book. Their other books include Clever, Leading Your Smartest and Most Creative People, and Why Should Anyone Work Here, which came out in 2015. They won the McKinsey Award for their Why Should Anyone Be Led by You HBR article. That's Rob and Gareth. The next person we inducting into the Hall of Fame for 2022 is actually a London Business School colleague of uh, Rob Goffey and Samantha Goshal, and that's Gary Hamill. Gary has been on the faculty of London Business School for more than 30 years, and he's director of the Management Lab. He's written 20 articles for the Harvard Business Review, and he's the most reprinted author in the review's history. His most recent bestsellers are Humanocracy with Michaela Zanini, What Matters Now, The Future of Management, and Leading the Revolution. In these volumes, Gary presents an impassioned plea for reinventing management and lays out a practical blueprint for building organizations that are fit for the future. He also collaborated with the great C.K. Prahlad and their book, Competing for the Future, which came out in 1994, was in question one of the most important books of the 1990s in the business sphere. The next inductee into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame for 2022 is Sally Helgerson. Sally is the world's premier expert on women's leadership, an internationally best-selling author, speaker, and leadership coach. 
The most recent book is How Women Rise, co-authored with the legendary executive coach Marshall Goldsmith. Her previous books include The Female Advantage, Women's Way of Leadership, came out in 1990 and was hailed as a classic in its field. Uh, the Female Vision, Women's Real Power at Work, which came out, out in 2010. And she's also the author of The Web of Inclusion, A New Architecture for Building Great Organisations, which came out in 1995. I think it was really ahead of its time. So Sally is a, the next inductee into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. The following inductee into the Hall of Fame is Stella Encomo. Stella is a professor in the Department of Human Resource Management in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria. She's a former scholar in residence at the Bunting Institute of Harvard University and a visiting scholar at the Tuck Business School at Dartmouth College. Stella is co-author of the critically acclaimed Harvard Business School press book, Our Separate Ways, Black and White Women, and the struggle for professional identity. So welcome to the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame, Stella and Como. And finally, but definitely not least, uh, in, inductees into the 2022 Hall of Fame comes Dana Zohar. Dana is a thought leader, physicist, philosopher, and author. Her work extends language and principles of quantum physics into a new understanding of human consciousness, psychology, and social organization, particularly the organization of companies. Her books include The Quantum Self, The Quantum Society, Rewiring the Corporate Brain, and The Quantum Leader. She has also championed the concepts of spiritual intelligence and spiritual capital in her books, SQ, Connecting with Our Spiritual Intelligence, and Spiritual Capital. Her most recent book is Zero Distance, Management in the Quantum Age, which examines her ideas and their influence on the evolution of the Chinese company Hire and its then CEO, Jiang Ray Min. So those are the inductees into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. They join a very uh, prestigious and elite group of wonderful thinkers. Uh, so welcome, Rob, Gary, Sally, Stella, and Dana. Uh, if there are interviews with Rob, Sally, Stella, and Dana already on our website, and an interview with Gary will be forthcoming very soon if you want further information. Uh, about their work. So it, to get the conversation off to a, a start, it'd be, be good to think about how, how you all see your careers look, looking back. And perhaps I could start with you, Stella. Um, what, what do you see as the, uh, what's the golden thread that, that runs through your career? What, how, how do you make sense of it now looking back? Uh, thank you, Stuart, and to my fellow inductees, uh, congratulations, and to the audience, hello. Uh, well, I would say the golden thread in my work is going against the grain. Uh, you know, when I, after, after I received my PhD, I wanted to look at issues of leadership, particularly looking at people who do not fit the accepted prototype of what a leader is and what a leader should look like, looks like. So I think the golden thread for me was trying to bring in the voice and the experiences of people who were not prototypically seen as leaders or portrayed as leaders. And therefore, I think what people say to me is I brought into the conversation the issue of racial difference and gender differences in leadership, particularly how the two intersect. So I think that's the thread. And it was also a thread in the sense of asking questions about management itself, the knowledge of management and the practice of management based on one reality, which I say was basically a European Western approach to leadership and management and there was no space for other ways of leading and thinking about what it means to be a leader, what it means to be a manager, and how you could actually lead people based on recognizing differences in culture and context. 
And what what was the starting point then? I think you kind of you, you let you laid out the the issue you're tackling with. What was the starting point in, in terms of your career? Well, the starting point was my own experiences. You know, being in working in corporate settings where I was often the only woman and always the only black woman and watching others advancing and wondering, you know, I have the same education, I have the same skill set, but I'm not moving. So my own experiences with exclusion and discrimination was the starting point. I think in terms of thinking beyond myself and my own experience, that happened when I started doing research after my graduate studies, where I was told I could not study race and gender in leadership, frankly. But one of the first studies I did, not to prolong the story, one of the first quantitative studies I did, I received a 10 page handwritten letter from a black woman manager where she talked in detail about the experiences of exclusion and discrimination that she was experiencing in her company. <laughs> so I decided then I was going to dedicate my career to making those stories visible and also to get management and theory and theory about those experiences to help future managers and leaders to make a difference <laughs> towards racial and gender equality. I'm sure Stella's st story uh, of, of her career uh, has some similarity or, 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 or raises memories for, for you, Sally. Uh, yes, Stuart, it definitely does. Um, we have very similar I would say motivations and uh, uh, to some degree, similar uh, paths of impact and influence. My, the starting point really of this phase of my career, I've been out there for a very long time. Uh, this phase of my career was really in the mid late eighties when I was doing some work in corporate communications. And I became aware that the organizations that I was working in, which were excellent, really outstanding, had basically no conception of the potential value women had to contribute as leaders. Uh, there, there wasn't even a way to talk about that. And the books that had been written uh, for women, both academic and popular, were basically, you know, get with the program, adapt. Uh, you're in the army now. If it moves, salute it. Uh, you're not going to change things. And I thought that that was very poor advice because I saw that organizations were changing profoundly. So what I really wanted to do was to begin to articulate what kinds of strengths women had to bring based on studies I did, not the ideas running through my own head. And, uh, and I j was just playing around with the idea and it became the female advantage, women's ways of leadership, which was really the first book that looked at what women had to contribute as leaders rather than how they needed to change and adapt. And I think that what I feel most where I feel the primary impact I've made is in two ways. One is in giving women a language to talk about what they believe they have to contribute as leaders. Um, I remember very similar to Stella, you know, I was told, you know, this is all soft skills. These aren't leadership skills. This is et cetera. And uh, same thing, getting a letter, a long letter, you know, you have helped me see that I, what I have is a leadership style. I thought it was just how I did things. So I thought I got to stick with this uh, and it hasn't always been easy, but um, yeah, I think the, the, so it was that giving that language, but it was also, I think that this work that I've done and then the, the, the continuing stream of work that's been done in this field has really helped redefine how we perceive excellence in leadership and in management and, and brought you know, ideas such as building relationships is a soft skill, not a leadership skill, has brought that kind of thinking into some degree of disrepute. So I do think it has had a larger impact on, again, how we look at what is desirable in terms of leadership. So it's been a very rewarding, if it's sometimes um, frustrating path. Tell us, well, your first book, Sally, was about um, tax, tax and oil men. 
which, is, which, which still intrigues me. Explain to me, explain to me how that fits in. It doesn't fit in at all. It okay. was before, before I was, it actually led me to working in corporate communications because I was studying independent oil producers uh, in Texas. I was, you know, working as a journalist uh, uh, for Harper's Magazine. They sent me down to uh, cover a murder trial. The murderer was in the oil business, and I thought I'd rather learn about the oil business than cover this sleazy trial. So that's what I did, and I ended up writing that book. And uh, it was, it, but it it kind of led to me going into corporate communications because a couple of the people were like, "Well, would you like to help us out by writing some?" Some um, some words for our for the speech I have to give at the Houston Petroleum Club next week. So this was after the book was published, so it wasn't really a conflict. But it was that's what set me on that path, which is very very different from you know my academic grounding training. Uh, but it was uh, you know there were women appear in that book as wives, and uh, so it, it 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 there it has no relations to this, but it was what got me interested in business. It what it's what got me interested in how people communicate and what got me interested in leadership. And Donna, it would be interesting to hear about what's the logic of your your career because you studied physics and philosophy at MIT. You did your postgraduate work in philosophy, religion, and psychology at, at Harvard University. How do you make sense of your career, Donna? I think the very beginning for me was a sense of great loss. I had been raised by uh, very devout Christian grandparents. And at the age of 11, I lost my faith in Christianity and religion in general, pretty much, because I saw that it clashed with the science I was learning. At the age of 15, I discovered quantum physics. And uh, for me, that was much more than a new idea in science. I found as a young teenager in quantum physics, a new way to look at myself and my life and uh, the things that teenagers are worried about, about life, its meaning, its purpose, et cetera. Um, I had intended to study physics at MIT but when I got there, I realized that I was far more interested in the philosophical views um, inherent within quantum science. Uh, so I studied physics and philosophy. Um, and then during my years of study at MIT and graduate school at Harvard, I came to see the impact that Newton's classical physics had had on framing all modern thought in psychology, economics, sociology, uh, management, <laughs> spirituality, etc. And even as a young student, I began to think, well, you know, quantum physics looks at things very differently than Newton did. And I wonder what all these issues would look like if we looked at them from a quantum perspective. Um, and this resulted a few years later in my first book, The Quantum Self. Um, a management professor in London read that book and much to my incredulous surprise, invited me to come speak to his MBA students. I said, I know nothing about management, you must be crazy. And he said, oh, trust me, come and talk. Um, they liked the lecture. He got me a job with Shell, uh, talking to a leadership training program. And slowly, slowly, I became someone who wrote about quantum physics and management. I mean, Stella and Sally have outlined some of the impediments and, and prejudices that they, they encountered in, 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 in their careers. I'm just wondering, what, what did managers and organizations make of, of quantum physics? Did you encounter a, a lot of skepticism or mystification? Um, a little fear when it was first mentioned, that's what I would talk about. But at the time, way back in the mid-1990s, when I began talking to companies and leadership conferences, it was already, there was a certain curiosity amongst the more queued up managers that this new science, complexity science and quantum science 
had something interesting for them. Um, so I didn't meet any particular barriers, a little bit of head scratching and hope you don't, you know, be too complicated for us. Um, I think I got quite good at explaining it in simple language. Um, so no, I, I didn't find a lot of impediment. I did to my work on spiritual intelligence because if you say to a company you're going to lecture on spiritual intelligence, they fear you're going to come in and sell them religion and uh, nobody wants that. And I had to um, explain to them very carefully that I had nothing about religion in mind with SQ. Uh, and then once me heard me talking about meaning and purpose and its relevance to leadership, that was okay too. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. The, Rob, uh, how did you get here and how do you make sense of uh, your, your career? Um, <clears throat> I, I, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the session and on behalf of Gareth and me, it's a great honour um, and to be part of this group. Um, so uh, to answer your question, Stuart, I feel I ought to maybe answer on behalf of both of us that I think both Gareth and I, we felt like um, frustrated industrial sociologists, I think, that um, when we found ourselves in a business school um, where we felt there was a rich mine of concepts within sociology that were just not very well applied as they could have been in business thought and business writing. You made a very nice little reference to the first book that Gareth and I wrote together, which was The Character of a Corporation. Um, and it's an attempt to apply two very old sociological concepts of solidarity and sociability uh, to understand corporate culture. Uh, in fact, really, it was about an attempt to understand corporate community. That's what was really driving us. Um, and I think that sort of, and of course, community is a very old sociological idea. And we felt there was just a lot that wasn't being properly applied. We tried to do it in that first book. Um, and we tried to do it, frankly, when we came onto the leadership uh, area that um, I guess we felt that the, the psychologists had had quite a big voice uh, in understanding of leadership. But there was a need for a bit more investigation of leadership as a relationship. It's not just about these wonderful individuals. Um, and also the fact that leadership also always occurs within context. Um, and so context, the social context and so on of leadership, you can't really understand it without some reference to that. And to understand context, you need to build in some sociology. So. I think Gareth and I were always trying to make old sociological concepts relevant to modern understanding of, of business. But your your PhD research was into in the mining community, wasn't it? Coal mining community in in the UK. Yeah, um, you know those kind of uh, traditional working class communities uh, were often seen to be very high in both sociability, friendship and so on, and solidarity, the ability to pull together fast in order to win. Two very different kinds of relationships, but seem to be both intense and overlapping in isolated industrial working class communities. And that actually was the subject of my PhD. Um, but Gareth and I, when we found ourselves at London Business School, uh, began to realise that these ideas had a kind of resonance when you were trying to understand what held corporations together. Um, and in fact, our, that first Harvard Business Review article we wrote ahead of the book, the title was What Holds the Modern Company Together? Um, because clearly our belief in hierarchy and structure was diminishing, if not disappearing completely. So you had to ask the question, well, what does hold large-scale communities 
of a corporate kind together. And we felt that the, the ideas of sociability and solidarity were good ones, and that there were some organizations high on sociability, but low on solidarity, which we call network kind of places, and others which were kind of very good at pulling together fast in order to win, high on solidarity, not very friendly, which we called rather provocatively mercenary. Uh, some organizations high on both, which we called communal, um, which are often the kind of intense high tech startup type enterprises and so on. And then other places which are seem to be almost low on both, low sociability, low solidarity, uh, where people go to work in order to be alone. Um, and, and we called those fragmented. Um, and we, I guess the other thing we wanted to do when we were doing that work was to suggest that quite a lot of cultural change in organizations is about um, evolution rather than revolution. And that um, it was a, if you were a kind of networked kind of culture, your challenge was to be as good at that as possible. That's not to say radical changes weren't possible, but a lot of the time it's about fine tuning what you've got. Which is a perfect segue into Gary Hamill, the, the author of Leading the Revolution. Yeah, Gary, Gary, looking back, I mean, I was I was surprised, but in in the way of these things that uh, competing for the future came out in 1994, which seems quite a long time ago. Um, looking back, what how do you make sense of your career, Gary? Well, uh, Stuart, thank you for uh, having me today, and uh, I'm very honoured to be in this group. You know, my my assumption was. Uh, uh, when 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 and when I was asked to be part of this Hall of Fame, is that's that's a pat on the back for the superannuated. Um, so I actually went and looked at the at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and and I was pleased to see that some of those inductees are still rocking it, like Buddy Guy and and the Rolling Stones. So I'm I'm going to take them as my role model rather than maybe the Beastie Boys. Um, but to your question. Um, you know, when I arrived at the London Business School, I got thrown in a class that I was very ill-prepared to teach on strategy. And at that time, Michael Porter had just published his, uh, you know, landmark book on competitive strategy. And it was, it helped us understand why some strategies are, are, are more effective than others. But the two questions very early that interested me were why, where do new game, stra game changing strategies come from? You know, at the time I was talking to people like Michael Dell and Anita Roddick and uh, others, but it was clear there was some magic when you could create something out of nothing. And I, I was very curious about that and interviewed more than a hundred business innovators to really understand the perceptual habits that made that happen. The other equally interesting question was when a large organization, be it a business school or a public sector organization or a company, when its strategy has reached its sell-by date or when it needs to reimagine itself, how does that happen? And of course, what I learned as many others have learned is that most large organizations are not very good at uh, kind of game-changing innovation and they are very slow to change. Often it happens you know, belatedly and in a crisis. And so that really led me to, to ask why. why. Why is innovation so hard at scale? Why are large organizations tend to be so inertial uh, and, and, and often behind the curve? And of course, what you understand then is that we have management systems and models that systematically disempower human beings. And you know, the data on this is, you know, has hardly changed in 50 years. I was talking uh, the other day to Jim Clifton, who runs Gallup. And you know, the data is there for anybody to see that only 20% of employees are engaged around the world. Only one out of eight uh, believes uh, their, their opinions matter at work. About one out of 12 are free to experiment. And so what, it, what at least what became clear to me, and I, that's why I was so interested to hear both Sally and Stella talk about this, is that we have organizations that often waste more human capacity than they, than they use, and where dignity and opportunity and equity are in very short supply. And if you're not finding those things at work, you're certainly not going to find enough of them in the rest of your life to make up the difference. And I think the steps towards more inclusivity and more diversity is a hugely important necessary step but perhaps only an earlier step on a much longer journey of how do we build organizations that really use the initiative and the ingenuity of every employee, which my last book was about. So in a very simple way, that was the journey from kind of starting out with this hard-headed view of strategy to recognizing that what we're really trying to do is build organizations where human beings can flourish. 
And if we figure out how to do that, then those organizations themselves will be able to help us solve all the daunting problems that are in front of humanity right now. I think your point about the Rolling Stones was a, was a fair one, Gary. We do expect you to keep on rocking. And I should say that the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame, unlike the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, does not ne necessitate a visit to Cleveland, Ohio. So it's <laughs> more, more attractive in many ways. It, talk about your mentors, Gary. Because you, uh, your initial work with, with CK was... With, with, yeah, that was, was you know, your... CK Prawlon obviously was an extraordinary individual. And uh, I had, you know, the great opportunity. I don't know how many articles we wrote, but we, we wrote a lot and we, were, we worked together for 70 <laughs> years. And what I learned from him and with him was a little bit, and I want to be very modest about this because none of us really know what kind of impact we have. Others will decide that in the fullness of time. But there are a few things, and, and Stella mentioned this at the beginning as well, there are a few things that hit me and that I learned through that relationship about how you multiply your, your, your personal impact in, in whatever you do. And certainly one of those is compassion. It's really showing up and, and caring about who you're with and their success. And that's a very rare commodity in, in a kind of cynical world. Certainly, Estella said it was about being a contrarian and being able to step outside and, and look at, look at uh, organizations and management in a different way. It was very much about being a builder and being willing to try things and experiment and not sit on the sidelines. And I guess most of all, even though sometimes the challenges seem extraordinarily daunting, you know, CK had just an extraordinary amount of hopefulness, right? Everything could be solved. Everything, you know, with new thinking and passion and energy, we could make progress. So those kinds of multipliers, I learned a lot from that relationship. And, um, you know, he's, he, he's, he's sadly missed. And I think uh, he's obviously one of the Hall of Fame members. And uh, so that was certainly one of the, the high points of my career. I've had the chance, I, I should say, and that many of my most important partnerships have been with companies uh, where I was, you know, they were kind enough to let me try something that nobody else had ever tried before. Uh, starting with Nokia back in the 1990s, I had this crazy idea of using open strategy and involving hundreds of people in trying to create their destiny, uh, which turned out pretty well. They didn't bother to ever reinvent themselves again, but it worked out pretty well the first time, you know, whether it was Shell and, 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 and getting them to try this idea of building internal markets, Shell Game Changer, which became another article for Harvard Business Review, whether more recently it was with Apple and we built a, a platform and 70,000 employees at Apple are on this platform collaborating. So my, my greatest debt is to organizations where there were people curious enough to say, yeah, we'll try to do something nobody's done before. Let's see what happens. And, um, you know, we learn something or, or, or we fail and have fun doing it. And so those are the people that I really uh, have the most gratitude for is let, let it, letting me fool around with their organizations. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Stella, perhaps we can go back to you um, and, and talk about your, your mentors, uh, the people who, who ignited your, your career. Can, can you tell us which, which individuals re really kick-started things for you? Uh, yes, for me, it was Professor George Ordeon, who was at the time known <laughs> for uh, working on the concept of management by objectives. And not that I really was really interested in management by objectives, but he, he recognized that I was the only black student in the MBA program, in the uh, doctoral program at the time. And, and I look back at it and, and he, he decided that he would just push me. And he was the person that helped me to find what I call my scholarly voice. So while others were trying to mute my voice, <laughs> George was encouraging me to use that voice. And he actually helped me to write my first article by saying, you have ideas and you must learn to express those ideas. And that gave me the, the courage to think about the importance of being able to articulate. I'll just tell you a funny story about George. George at the time, I'm talking in the 1980s, he was a very well-known management consultant. He was going all over the world, putting the idea of management by objectives out there. And he had an opportunity to work with a nickel mining company in Sudbury, Canada. I was a, a second year doctoral student, you know, not knowing much. 
And George could not make this engagement. They wanted somebody to come in and to talk to them about managing. And George couldn't go. And, and he said, Stella, I want you to go. <clears throat> like, no, George, I'm not prepared. And he said, no, you can do it. So he sent me to Sudbury, Canada. And I showed up there in a nickel mining environment in the freezing cold. And I think they were just as surprised to see me as I was to be there. But it was a great learning experience. In fact, related to the point of how would I, as an African-American woman, relate to these miners. They were undergoing a terrible uh, management union battle, a strike about that. And so I had to talk about you know, conciliation, working together. And it went well. And I, he just gave me the sense that, you know, yes, you're different, but you clearly belong and you have something to say and you can make a contribution. And I, I, and I try to pass it on to other people that it's important that, uh, first of all, we recognize our own talent and to have the courage to go into spaces where you think you may not be welcome. You can bring something different. And so, yeah, so he, he left it a huge imprint and he really helped me to gain my confidence in terms of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to say to the world. In yeah, fact, I'll, just, I'll end with this. He was such a, when I took my first job at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, he actually flew down to make sure that I was okay. And he actually met with my dean to say, this is a very talented young lady and I hope you'll treat her well. <laughs> right, what a really, really nice story, Stella. Because what's nice is that connects back to management by objectives. It's kind of 1958, I think. Yes. And, and it was it was really influential at the time and, and well known and I know Peter Drucker wrote about management by, right. by objectives as well. So yours is kind of a, a career by objectives, perhaps. Well, George had been a student of Peter Drucker. In interesting. So it all it all connects. Yes, it does. You, you're Af African American, but you're now based in South Africa. Yes, I Stella. am. How, yeah. how did how did the move to South Africa in for, challenge challenge your preconceptions and change change the direction of your work? Uh, yeah, it, it well, it gave me a broader context to understand that even though I had talked about the issues of marginalization and exclusion in the U.S. context, when I got to South Africa. It was a totally new and different context. And I think it's giving me more of a global perspective, but just again, I like to tell stories and, 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 and Rob, you would be interested in this too, because I actually use some of your work in my class. But when I got to South Africa and this sounds naive, but I should be frank. I was worried about whether or not I could teach leadership to MBAs there because I knew the American context. I knew about American businesses. I had stories about American leaders. And I get to South Africa and I went into a panic. I know nothing about leaders in Africa. I know nothing about leaders in South Africa. So I started looking for material about African leaders and I could not find any. And, 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 and at the time, South Africa, I went to South Africa in 2000. That's about six years after Mandela became president. <laughs> and the, the kinds of issues that my students were dealing with, I found that the materials I had, the top cases from Harvard Business Review were basically not very helpful to them. So I had to do a lot of learning. I had to come up with ideas about how I could engage them in leadership and also bringing in their experiences and their context. But I tell you one thing, uh, Rob, that really helped was using your HBR article because of that profound question. Why would anybody want to be led by you? And so that was a way to enter in conversation with the students and to ask them, who are you? Where do you come from? How could your own culture and background and the issues that you face inform how you lead others? Uh, yeah, so that, that was helpful, but I did find that I had to do a lot of uh, reading 
And that, and that propelled me, Stuart, then to start talking about more about this idea that the knowledge we had at leadership at that time was too Eurocentric and not helpful to some of the other contexts of the world. So that propelled me to look more at issues of understanding uh, leadership in <laughs> Africa and the challenges that being in the other part of the world or in the global South in, in, in challenge, the challenge of the dominance of the global North. So I expanded my thinking about inclusion from a kind of black versus white concept that I had from the US to more in terms of power, uh, pow global geopolitical power differences across the world and how that impacts leadership and who makes big decisions about how companies should operate. Thanks, Stella. Sally, can, can we come to you and just talk, talk about the people and the mentors you had early in your career and who shaped your thinking? Yes, uh, certainly. And, you know, I realized I was so excited to answer your questions before I didn't tell you this is such an honor. And it is such an honor to be inducted into this Hall of Fame and to be with this, especially to be with this uh, extraordinary group of thought leaders, really very meaningful to me. I would say the primary mentor that I have had has really been Frances Hesselbein. And Frances, I call, I, for a long time, she was what I would call a stealth mentor in that uh, I don't know if she was aware that I had taken her as my mentor. Uh, very different, really, in a way than a role model. I was just fascinated by how she did things and by, the, uh, by how she built connections. And, you know, I really realized the extent to which I had met her because I was interviewing her. Well, really not interviewing, doing a diary study of her for the female advantage when she was still uh, at the Girl Scouts, but very busy being on the cover of Business Week and Fortune, et cetera. And then with Peter Drucker talking her up as one of the uh, best leaders in the world. So I had the opportunity to spend um, a week shadowing her and watching how she did things. <laughs> and it was it was quite a, quite an experience. And I wanted to adapt some of her ways of being and leading and thinking into my own practice. What I realized later was that in this field, with a very few exceptions, Henry Mintzberg, Tom Peters, a couple other people, virtually everybody that I know, this extraordinary network I've been connected with over the last 35 years, has come directly or tangentially third degree of separation through Francis. Another way in which Frances influenced me was really her longevity. And she was, she stopped traveling when she was 97, but it was very, very inspiring to me. As I moved further into my career, I was in a lot of depressing conversations with other women who did what I did about, you know, well, our audiences are getting younger, you know, we're getting older, what are they going to say, where did they dig her up, that sort of thing. And, um, and I was at kind of at a height of thinking about this in the <clears throat> late 90s. And I was at an event where Francis was also. And it was, you know, it was a, a, a leadership event. We were supposed to do some silly exercise like laughing yoga. And people had to get down on the floor. And I was next to Francis, who at that, that point looked to me to be about four foot nine. And uh, I was lying next to her and she was participating. And I just had this thought. I think I was about 63 at that time. I thought, you know, if, no, it wasn't. It wasn't in the 90s. It was in 2000. Anyway, it was probably about 2010. And I looked over at her and I thought, you know, if I live to be Francis's age, I would be mid-career right now. So I am going to shift my thinking and I'm going to think of myself when I hit 65, I was a couple of years short then, I'm going to think of myself as mid-career at 65. And it changed everything for me. Thinking of myself as mid-career rather than winding down was one of the most energizing and inspiring things I ever did. So in that way, also, I was using Francis as a stealth mentor. The other mentor, of course, that I've had has been Marshall, who has Marshall Goldsmith, uh, our fellow Hall of Famer, and uh, who... who um, 
who always pushed me to in a very much very similar way that Stella described, even though we were colleagues and basically the same age, uh, he pushed me to, um, to make the most of, of what I had and always felt that I wasn't representing myself uh, as force, <clears throat> not forcefully, but as um, I, that I wasn't claiming uh, my achievements. And that was really, really helpful for me. So he's been the other mentor I've had. And, and Gary, I did want to say about five years ago, I had lunch with Tom Peters in New York. And he said to me, he was in the Hall of Fame. And he said, um, you know, Sally, once they start naming you to a Hall of Fame, you'll know you're getting old. <laughs> so I didn't think of it in terms of rock and roll, but that's a great image. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Sally. Um, but I, th I think we have, uh, I, mean, I, I know Stella's mum, mother was very in, in, in influential in her career and she's still still around at 102 and I think Gar Gary's dad ma ma made it made a century as well so there's lots of inspirational older people suggesting you were all in mid-career um <laughs> Donna it would be it, it'd be interesting we're talking about mentors mentors Donna your relationship with the CEO of Hire uh Jang Ray Min who's now the chairman emeritus of, of Hire that's been really important for your career and your, your thinking. Can you, can you tell us more about that relationship and what, how, how you struck a, a, struck a nerve with him with your talk of uh, philosophy and quantum physics? Yes, uh, Zhang Ray Min not only had an influence on my career, you could say he's responsible for the fact that I'm still active in my career. When... Uh, Mr. Zong first wrote to me in 2014 uh, to invite me to come to Qingdao to meet him and his leadership team, telling me that my work had had a major influence on the thinking that developed into his Rendonye business model. I was at a critical point in my own life because though I had been invited to speak to companies, the Western management establishment, the business schools, the um, the people who matter, the opinion setters, had completely ignored my work and laughed at it if they knew about it. I was dismissed as a new age loony. And I'd reached a low point of thinking, um, perhaps it's my own crazy obsession, this quantum physics stuff. <clears throat> Nobody else here seems to believe in it. And when I went to China to see Zhang Min and did a month long speaking tour of China itself, I discovered that Mr. Zhang had been reading my books for 25 years, having them privately translated for himself, uh, which I couldn't have imagined. And that my books had been published in China and I had quite a significant following there. And I got an enthusiastic response from Chinese audiences far greater than I'd ever got in the West. And it rejuvenated and reassured me. And I thought, well, people in the West may not believe in me, but at least Dong Rei Min and the Chinese do. So I wrote the last two of my most recent books. Um, Mr. Zhang, is himself known as the philosopher CEO in China. Um, he loves reading books. He reads five books a week for the last 20, 30 years at least. He loves discussing philosophy. And when I meet with him in Qingdao, we tend to have philosophical conversations, uh, philosophy both East and West. Um, so yes, he's been a very special figure in my life. And I thank him for the fact that I kept going and will keep going now until I can no longer type a keyboard. Long may you continue, Donna. Um, Rob, can I turn to, turn to you once again and just ask you about your, your partnership? I mean, we've been talking about mentors, and uh, but ob obviously you had kind of an inbuilt mentoring relationship 
uh, or perhaps mutual coaching relationship with with Gareth, who you wrote all your books with. What, how, how did that work? Can you just talk about the, your relationship? Um, we'd known each other a very long time, so we'd met each other as, as students, doctoral students um, at the University of Kent. Um, and basically, you know, we stayed in contact for many years after that and eventually ended up as colleagues at London Business School. Um, and listening to this conversation and seeing Gary again and thinking about Sumantra and others like uh, Charles Handy, um, who was just leaving the school when I think Gary and I joined. But I'm struck by what good colleagues we generally had. My relationship with Gareth was certainly helped by the fact that, you know, to write with someone for 30 years um, is fairly extraordinary. Um, we did a lot of uh, other work to do together, consulting and teaching. So it was a fairly uh, rich relationship. Um, and some of you may already know that um, Gareth himself had a, a kind of interesting career, primarily academic, but um, a period where he was um, Global HR Director for Polygram, uh, where Gary, he would have dealt with some of those other Hall of Fame characters you've been talking about um, at first hand. Um, and then he also had a career at the BBC as HR Director for the BBC. Um, those were both very big jobs and it, it, it was extremely enriching, I think, in our relationship that Gareth was able to bring some of that hands-on experience from two very different places. Um, but of course, both those places full of clever creatives um, who often don't really want to be in organisations at all. Um, and that was a big inspiration for, you know, thank you, Stella, for your kind words about why should anyone be led by you? Um, it, it's, it's precisely these clever, creative types in places like the BBC and Polygram that are the ones we'll ask more than most, you know, why should anyone be led by you? And so a lot of that, a lot of his experience, I think, uh, drove some of our obsessions in that book and then the book on leading clever people. Um, and even the last book we did together, Why Should Anyone Work Here, was an acknowledgement, I think, that, you know, people want to be excited by great leaders, but they also want to work in exciting places. Um, and of course, many of us, Gary, for sure, is, I think, really interested in, in what constitutes an exciting place. Um, and I think that's a, still a really interesting question, post COVID and the virtual world, et cetera, et cetera. What does a workplace mean? Um, but Gareth's experience, hugely important in our writing and very informative for me too. So you're right, Stuart, he was a kind of, I like to think we mentored each other, but it was a privilege to work with him for so long. Again, you've provided me with a first perfect segue in, in, into Gary. Um, and Gary, I mean, the, the, the figures you quoted earlier about levels of engagement, et cetera, which are, 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 are dismal and always, always have been, leads me to a, a question which I, I'm going to ask all of you is, has progress been made? Gary? Yeah, I think I would say yes but haltingly. And I think, you know, people who know my work would know that I believe we're kind of getting close to one of those inflection points in which we see substantial institutional change. You know, almost, almost everything we know about organizations, all the great thinkers of Peter Drucker and Jim March and so on, we learned in organizations that fit that old industrial age template where power trickles down and big leaders appoint little leaders and people compete for the scarce resource of promotion and you mark your career by, by climbing a pyramid. And I think that model is becoming an enormous competitive liability. You see in examples like Hire, where you run 
an immense global operation with only two or three layers of management where everybody is working in a very small entrepreneurial unit and they're connected together through contracts. So, you know, if you look back through human history, you see these systems that often worked better for the few than the many. And that was true of, of slavery. 70% of, of individuals in ancient Athens were slaves. It was true of patriarchy. Uh, it was true of, 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 of monarchical and clerical power. And I think we're at that point again. I think there's a whole set of pressures building a younger generation coming to work, the technology that allows us to build organizations that are much more lateral than vertical. So I'm, you know, I, I think we're poised. Uh, when you look at the data, it's hard to see enormous uh, progress yet. I think many leaders are still hoping that they can put off this day of reckoning, that they don't have to uh, think about organizations that are as different from what we have now is maybe YouTube is different from you know the BBC, but I think I think that that shift is coming. Uh, all of the, all of the components are there: the technology, the need, the problems. So you know, one of the things, and I I like Sally's point about being in mid career. I'm not sure I thought about it that way, but clearly, if you if you want to stay young in your career, you always want to have a problem that's big enough that you know you still have to keep working on it and you know there's some ways to go. And so I'm both very optimistic of where we are, but also quite quite thoughtful that there's a lot more work to be done and that deep systemic change does not happen easily. And, you know, we talked about evolutionary and revolutionary. One of my certainly beliefs all along is that it's kind of both. You, you, you have to be able to have a revolutionary uh, point of view about the future. You have to be able to imagine a future that's quite different than the status quo. But we all have to get there one step at a time. And, uh, you know, there's no, there's no upheaval. There's no, that's, that's not going to work. So for me, I'm, I'm, res I'm cautiously optimistic, but spending all of my time now really thinking not about individual organizations, but how do you get more systemic change? Because truth is many individual CEOs may not have the courage by themselves to do what's next. And you take comfort from looking what's happened with diversity inclusion, what's, what's happened with climate, and you realize it is possible for us to pull ourselves together and do really important and difficult work. Let's see if your cautious optimism is infectious. Uh, a few final words. Stella, are you, you, do you think progress has been made and are you optimistic quickly? I'm optimistic and cautious. I think it's going to take people to rise to the occasion, to the occasion, and to be comfortable with the uncertainty. You know, uh, people want recipes. You know, with diversity and inclusion, everybody wants a list of what to do, and I think that's still the wrong approach. So I really agree with Gary. People have to really be comfortable with taking risk and letting go of this whole idea of this is what a corporation is, this is what a successful person looks like, and just really trying to create organizations where people can flourish. And until we do that, we're not gonna take, we're not gonna solve the world's problems, and we're not gonna ever uh, create the type of context where we can build a sustainable world. So I just hope that people can let go of the way we do things. I think part of the problem is companies talk themselves into the way we have done things will allow us to be successful and afraid of change. And it's the same thing with kind of people pushing back on the reality that many more people have talent and they don't look like the stereotypical leader and we must just embrace that. Thank you, uh, Stella. Uh, Sally, are you, are you optimistic? Well, certainly in my own field of women's leadership, I'm, I'm very optimistic and I've seen tremendous change and it is dramatically encouraging. In terms of the adaptability of organizations, I think we're going to learn a lot from from the, the war that's happening now. We are seeing limits of top-down leadership like we have never seen. We are seeing the role of solidarity and small unit improvisation to an extent we have, we have not witnessed. Uh, and the technology is bringing that to us. So a lot of innovation comes in the, in the wake for better or for worse of, of uh, military conflict and military learning. And I think this is going to have a big impact. So I, I can't frame that as optimistic. 
but but I do think that that we're going. There's a lot to be learned here that goes in 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 line with some of the ideas, uh, particularly that that Rob and Gary have expressed. Sally, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone else, the new inductees into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame for 2022, uh, mid-career thinkers, as I now like to think of them. Um, so thank you to Rob Goffey, thank you to Gary Hamill, Sally Helgerson, Stella and Como, and Dana Zohar. Uh, the first port of call really should be all of their works. I would encourage you to check, check, them, out, check them out, but buy copies as soon as you can and refer to them for the rest of your own career. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. More information and interviews with all those featured today is available on the Thinkers50 website. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>